Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for coming in on uh, weathering the, uh, the extreme cold to come tonight's talk. Uh, let me start uh, just by uh, showing you uh, something that we see uh, every so often when we're on uh, hiking trips out at a place we have uh, in northern New Mexico. Uh, my wife and I have a place out there, and, and we often go on hikes, and we see this, uh, this little uh, plant, Mirabilis, also known as the Colorado uh, 4 o'clock. And uh, what I, I, I recognize this plant, and I thought I'd take two pictures on a walk we were having on one day. I took one picture at 2 p.m., and as you see, the plant uh, looks like it's about to die. All the blooms are, are, are withered. And uh, we came back from the hike at 6 p.m., and of course, now we have these, uh, these lovely blooms, uh, the, the plant looking quite healthy. And there's no trick photography here. You can see this branch. It's the same plant. So. Uh, <laughs> So this is, this is an example of a circadian rhythm. This is a, a, a plant that's living in an arid uh, environment. Uh, this canyon country in the desert southwest, it's very arid. Water's precious, and it takes a great deal of water to open those blooms each day. So uh, this rhythmic uh, activity, uh, we think, is, uh, uh, reflects the activity of the pollinator, in this case, which is a hawk moth. And the hawk moths are only uh, active at night. And, uh, uh, opening those blooms during the day when the, when the pollinator isn't around would take water that uh, is, is quite precious. So this seems to be a, a coupling of circadian rhythms in two organisms, the pollinator and the pollinated. Uh, and I, I think it's a wonderful example of the fact that these rhythms are all around us. If you open your eyes, you will, uh, you'll just see things like this. Another uh, example that may be a little more familiar is uh, an example taken from uh, a hamster, now many of you have had hamsters at pet, as pets or kids with ham hamsters as pets, and you may hear that running wheel going all night long, <laughs> keeping uh, the dog awake. Uh, this, is a, this is an experiment that lasted 25 days, and this hamster is in the dark for the entire uh, duration of the experiment. Each one of these lines is uh, 24 hours, so we're following day one, two, three, and so forth for the uh, length of the experiment. Now, when the, when the animal is on its running wheel, uh, again, constant darkness for the whole experiment, we see these deflections that are uh, collected uh, by an event recorder, as we call them. And what, what I, I find still quite remarkable looking at this kind of a, a display is that uh, you can tell within a couple of minutes uh, from day to day when that animal is going to get on that running wheel and when it's going to get uh, off. Uh, another. Uh, very important point is that these are not vertical records. They're not 24-hour uh, rhythms. They're running out to the left, which means the, the, the rhythm that we're seeing here is slightly less than 24 hours. It can't possibly reflect something uh, going on uh, in the environment with a 24-hour cycle that reflects the Earth rotation. So this has to be something internal. So what I want to talk about uh, uh, tonight are what are these circadian clocks, what do they control, and how are they established. And then I want to go on to some more recent work we've been doing uh, in humans, which looks at studies of broken circadian clocks in humans, and uh, uh, which may help us understand some of the disorders of sleep and other medical problems. So let me go back to that hamster for just a moment and point out that in the 1970s, it was recognized that there's a small region of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And nobody can say that, so we just call it the SCN. And this is a region which, uh, if, you, if you put uh, a radioactive form of glucose in, of sugar in the, in the uh, water supply for the animal, uh, you see that uh, that radioactivity oscillates day and night so that you see the SCN labeled uh, abundantly during the day, uh, but you can't even see it. It's so poorly labeled uh, uh, in the, at night. If uh, in, the, in the 1970s there were experiments, surgical experiments, in which this region, region was ablated surgically, and the results on behavior uh, were followed, and what it was found was that those animals could no longer express those behavioral rhythms that I showed you on that locomotor uh, activity plot a few minutes ago. So we have an SCN. Every one of us has an SCN. It's, it's uh, uh, part, of, part of our hypothalamus. It's connected 
through the optic nerves uh, to our eyes, and it's rhythmic, and it's rhythmic as, uh, and, and its rhythms will be uh, reset daily by exposure to light, so long as the, the, uh, the eyes are intact and this uh, uh, optic uh, nerve tract is, in, uh, is intact. But in blind individuals that have either lost their eyes or for some uh, reason have lost their optic nerves, uh, the uh, supercap, the SCN, will oscillate and will send instructions to the body uh, to sleep and wake, but no longer in synchrony uh, with the outside world. And so it will look, uh, individuals of that sort will look very much like that hamster in which the natural internal rhythm uh, holds forth. Now, among the things we know the SCN does, uh, or, or uh, uh, for some years now, we know that it influence, uh, influences the pineal gland, which releases melatonin. And many of you are familiar with the, the sleep-promoting uh, effects of melatonin. Uh, and uh, that's produced rhythmically by the pineal gland uh, in response to instructions coming from the SCN, but what we really want to know is what's going on inside the SCN that produces that rhythmic activity? What is the clock inside this organ? So uh, our big break came uh, in the early 1970s when Ron Kanapka and Seymour Benzer, two scientists, uh, Ron was a student, a graduate student, Seymour Benzer was a professor at Caltech, and uh, they had used Drosophila uh, to generate mutations, they would feed the, uh, uh, the flies a chemical mutagen that would cause breaks in the chromosomes. And they found that uh, on treating Drosophila in that way, they were able to isolate mutants that had altered clocks that ran uh, at the wrong rate. So instead of having a nearly 24-hour rhythm, they found one mutant that was rhythmic, another mutant that had a fast-running clock that cycled every 19 hours, and a third that had a 28-hour rhythm. And when I saw this, uh, I realized that this is behaving very much like switching the gears around in a mechanical clock, and that possibly this is a way in to understanding what's going on inside something like the SCN, what is a, a, a biological clock, a circadian clock. So many years later, after I'd arrived at Rockefeller, 13 years later, uh, uh, my colleagues and I were able to uh, isolate the gene, the physical gene corresponding to that mutated by Ron Kanopka and Seymour Benzer. And we were able to uh, find that gene and to uh, uh, isolate it in pure form and micro-inject it into uh, embryos that have the permutation. And if those embryos had not been treated, they would grow up to produce arrhythmic flies. But by injecting this DNA into these embryos, by that DNA being taken up by the nuclei of those embryos, we restored rhythmicity. We got normal rhythms out of a previ previously arrhythmic uh, fly. So that indicated that, yes, uh, there is a gene that has this capacity to uh, inform with regard to a sleep-wake cycle, a circadian clock. But of course, that's just one gene. And inspecting that one gene in many different ways didn't give us nearly enough clues to understand uh, how that clock, how that, how that gene was helping to make a circadian clock. There were a couple of things that came up that were of interest uh, in the first few years that we and, and colleagues at Brandeis, Jeff Hall and Michael Rosbash, who were also recognized with the Nobel Prize, uh, there were a couple of things that were of interest. One was that we saw that the gene switches on and on with a circadian rhythm, with a daily rhythm but we didn't know why. We also saw something very surprising, which was the genes seemed to be active in many, many uh, different tissues all around uh, the animal. We thought we were looking at something that controlled sleep-wake behavior, and yet this was a gene that seemed to be present almost everywhere. And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, tell you more about uh, that finding later. So we decided that uh, uh, we'd uh, better start looking for additional genes, and we were hopeful that we might be as lucky as Ron and, uh, and Seymour and find a new gene as they had in the first couple of hundred uh, mutated flies. But in fact, as you see here, this is a Photoshop uh, version of the experiment, but we went through 7,000 bottles of, of uh, fruit flies. Each bottle has to be looked at several times a day to find an aberrant running clock in one of those bottles. And we found one in 7,000. But it was a terribly important gene. It was a gene that we named timeless. 
And it, it was especially important because we, real, we came to understand that it was a partner for the first gene, period. In fact, if you eliminate that gene, the cycling properties of the period gene would go away, and even the period uh, product would disappear. So we had a very tight working relationship of the very next gene uh, with the first gene. And that convinced us that this kind of an approach, a genetic approach, could uh, perhaps reveal uh, the workings, the inner workings of one of these circadian clocks. Now, we didn't want to have to repeat this over and over again. I can't even imagine what a million bottles of flies would look like. But you can do something uh, much more effectively, which is to look at locomotor activity much like we would have a running wheel with a hamster. This is a, a, a device in which we just have a small tube big enough for a fly to move back and forth and turn around. Uh, an infrared light source and a phototransistor on the other side. And this is a, an example of a tray full of those uh, kinds of arrangements. And uh, every time the fly moves and breaks that beam of light, there's an event uh, sent to a computer, which uh, fortunately, by this time, personal computers were available to set up this kind of equipment. And in this kind of an arrangement, we can look at tens of thousands of mutagenized flies in a year. And we did this and found nine genes that fit together like puzzle pieces uh, in the sense that uh, they explained how this clock was working. And uh, th these are just some examples of the many different kinds of uh, rhythms that were coming uh, out of these uh, mutants. We had fast-running clocks, slow-running clocks, nearly arrhythmic clocks. Uh, we got uh, uh, a number of mutants uh, that fell in, but they all fell into just nine genes. And I'm just going to tell you about four components of these clocks to give you uh, an overview of what we found. So the way this system works is that there are two genes, the first gene isolated, period, it turns out, and the second, timeless, which are switched on by uh, two proteins that uh, uh, flick on these genes and cause them to send instructions for manufacturing proteins, a period protein from instructions from the per gene and a timeless protein from instructions coming from the switched on timeless gene. Now, when uh, these two proteins by themselves have no activity, they're inert proteins. But uh, as the levels of these proteins rise, they can form a combined product in which the period and timeless proteins fit together and in that uh, configuration, these new proteins now move to the nucleus, where they seek out the genes that uh, uh, produced instructions to make them and shut the genes off. So it's a feedback uh, uh, loop of sorts. Now, uh, an important feature of this is that it oscillates. We, can understand, we understand now why it oscillates in a, in a daily uh, uh, light-dark cycle. When the sun is up, uh, daylight blocks a part of this process. It blocks, uh, the, it, it, uh, blocks the production of timeless. Timeless becomes destabilized uh, when uh, daylight is present. It's degraded. And of course, if PER doesn't have a partner, it's never going to get into the nucleus. But in fact, it has uh, another, another uh, partnership that it can make, and that's with a, a protein called double time. And when double time uh, matches up with period, it changes the structure of period in such a way that it uh, also uh, falls apart. So when the light's on, when daylight, when the sun rises and stays on for the next few hours, uh, neither timeless nor period proteins can be produced. So you can't produce the inhibitor that would shut these genes back off. So all day long, we're amassing instructions to make period and timeless proteins. But those are sterile instructions that can give rise to no protein. Now, what happens when the sun goes down? Well, now timeless can accumulate because uh, it's not being destroyed by light. Timeless and period can join in this uh, special uh, new uh, partnership. That partnership will, will uh, move, that, those partner proteins will move back into the nucleus where the genes are and shut these genes back off. So you can see that we have an oscillation that will be uh, in line with the external uh, turning uh, of the Earth, the night and day cycles of the Earth. Now, you might say, how can nine genes control so many features or something as con 
uh, complicated as a sleep-wake behavioral cycle. But in fact, these genes, by doing this, not only affect their own expression, but affect the expression of hundreds of other genes in the fly. So for example, this is a map of 150 genes reading top to bottom, where each gene's activity, indicated by changes from red to green and green to red, uh, have waves of activity and inactivity. So red means high uh, activity, green means low activity, and, and every four hours we're looking at the activity of that gene for six days. And the genes that are turned on at dawn are at the top of the graph. Down here are genes turning on at noon, here at dusk, midnight, and so forth. So what you see is that there's, uh, there, there are genes with similar but subtle differences in their timing. And we see these stripes of red and green uh, that go across in a diagonal fashion uh, across this, uh, uh, this plot. Now, the, the fact that they're not vertical or not in blocks of day and night means that this isn't a system that just has a nighttime function and a daytime function. In fact, it's timing uh, gene expression uh, all through the day uh, and night, every hour of the day and night, there's a different combination of highs and lows for all of these genes. So an important feature of all of this is that this, these are the same data that I showed you uh, uh, on the last slide, but over here are data that are derived, plotted in the same way, but this time from three clock mutants, from the period mutant, which doesn't have the, the period gene, the timeless mutant doesn't have the timeless gene, and one of those genes that switches uh, period and timeless on uh, in, in, uh, uh, when period and timeless are absent. And what you see is the stripes are gone. So this, this still fascinates me because this is a system that must have evolved in response to the usefulness of following light-dark cycles. And yet several uh, hundreds of millions of years later after this system has evolved, it is essential to have a clock interpreting those light-dark cycles in order to get the system to work. In the absence of a clock, light and dark cycles can't drive rhythmicity out of this biological system. So the clock is central in that, in that way. Now, if we look at, uh, I'd mentioned before that one of the things that we saw when we originally uh, found the PER gene and began to uh, study it was that it was expressed all over the body. Now we know that these clocks exist all over the body. They're not just in the brain. They're in the lungs, they're in our liver, they're in our skeletal muscle, they're even on our skin. And they're, they're composed in the same way in all of these uh, locations, but they control different groups, large groups of genes uh, in each of these locations to do location-specific work. And uh, uh, one of the things that we've been also uh, amazed to see is that while an animal that's kept in a single time zone is quite happy and all of its clocks uh, agree, these clocks agree because they're sensing different signals, rhythmic si signals in the environment, uh, which are synchronizing them, but they're sensing different signals. So the skeletal muscle and liver uh, and lung are sensing different signals than the brain. The brain follows light. These follows food, follow food. So for example, uh, an experiment's been done by uh, two of my colleagues uh, in which uh, uh, the meal time uh, for the mouse is changed. So we have a, a mouse that is living in New York City. Uh, it's exposed to the lighting and the light dark cycles in New York City, but its meal times are going to come as if it's in Tokyo. And what happens is that uh, this causes the clocks to wander off away from each other. No, they're no longer in synchrony with, with one another. Uh, they've given up on following the brain, which is still following the light cycle, in light dark cycle in New York City. And many of these are taking a compromised position uh, that, that reflects the timing of that meal, one hour of day of, of the day uh, that's uh, associated with being in Tokyo. Now this has a lot uh, that is similar to what we suffer from when we take a trip, a transatlantic trip or a transpacific trip. Jet lag is very much this kind of a state in which our system uh, of clocks occupies temporarily multiple time zones. So for example, uh, if we fly halfway around the world from here to Tokyo, our brain will reset fairly quickly within a day or two, 
the lung will, uh, will, uh, will come around after uh, three, four, five days. Slowest is the liver, which takes a full week to come around and agree with the due time zone. So you can think about this while you're on your trip. Uh, <laughs> you're, uh, you're, you, you're leaving parts of your body in every time zone you've passed during your trip. So in, in, uh, in, in, health, in healthy subjects, of course, in healthy uh, organisms, we have a variety of uh, uh, controlled functions, uh, all of which are, are uh, familiar to you. Uh, control of uh, melatonin secretion, blood pressure, body temperature, all of these things are oscillating. And they're oscillating in response to that long and complicated genetic program that's going on uh, through independent clockworks in all of these different parts of the body. If we uh, move, move to a, a, a more uh, a deeper level uh, in this system and ask about particular areas of our biology, we find that there are, there are many areas in which circadian clocks are governing the responses that we have. So for example, our immune systems, key cells in our immune systems are using circadian clocks to become active, less and more active in a cyclical fashion across the day. So, for example, many of you may appreciate that we're much more prone to infection at certain times of day than in others, and this reflects circadian rhythmicity of the components of these immune systems. Something that's just within the last couple of years uh, been realized is that wound healing is strikingly different day or night. If you have a burn wound and it occurs during the day, that wound will heal much more rapidly than would the same wound if it occurred at night. And this is a reflection of the circadian components to the regenerative machinery that's at work in repairing uh, that wound. Uh, metabolic health, I think one of the ways we, we see the importance of uh, these clocks uh, in metabolic health is that if you specifically knock out these clocks, knock out these genes, just in the pancreas, let's say, uh, that animal will, even though it has clocks that are running fine elsewhere, uh, that animal will become diabetic. If you knock out those genes in the liver, you'll get a disorder that uh, looks very much like uh, metabolic syndrome. So each of these organs plays a, an essential role uh, that is, that is uh, mediated, that is, uh, that is integrated with circadian rhythmicity. Cardiac care, blood pressure treatment, I can talk about later. Chemotherapy, we now realize that side effects and potency are very much dependent, can be, can be very much dependent on time of day of delivery of that chemotherapeutic agent. And uh, prescription drug efficiency, I'll just mention uh, very briefly, we, we, we have uh, 100 best-selling drugs in the US. 56 of those uh, are working, are, are giving their results because they're hitting circadian targets, that is, targets that are oscillating across the day. Now, of those 56, half have half-lives less than six hours long, which, in other words, means if you take that drug at six in the morning, by, t by six in the evening, the effective dose is a quarter or less than a quarter that which you originally took. So you better know what time of day the target uh, is peaking uh, in order to prescribe the right time of day for taking that drug. And I've noticed on my recent uh, prescriptions, there are little boxes now uh, that are supposed to be checked, but they're not, that say, what time should you, should you take this? Uh, and of course, down here, this just illustrates the massive uh, size of the circadian program. Uh, roughly 45% of all genes, uh, of all of our genes, are rhythmic due to the action of these circadian clocks. Uh, more than half of the known uh, genes associated, known to be associated with disease, uh, are circadian, are, are rhythmic, with a, uh, are produced with a circadian, are active with a circadian rhythm. Now, in the final few minutes, I'd like to uh, uh, tell you briefly about a recent study we've been doing on night owls, human night owls, and, and this is this is a, a question that uh, came up uh, in thinking about how might human changes in these genes, would we, what kinds of effects would human changes uh, in these genes produce on sleep behavior? And we thought a good candidate might be uh, what, we, what is formerly known as delayed sleep phase behavior, but as seen in this cartoon, what it really is is a night owl-like uh, syndrome. 
late to get to bed, late to get out of bed. And I can give you an example of this here. This is a control subject that's been given a, a, a wristwatch that uh, monitors activity. They're also asked to keep a log of when they get into bed and when they get out of bed. And what you see for this control subject is they're very good every day. They're getting in bed at about the same time, about 11.30 at night, and they're getting up at 7, 7.30 uh, every morning. Very consistent, uh, highly rhythmic. Down here is a DSPD subject that we've spent a lot of time uh, studying, and it's chaos. What you, what, what, what you see is, and this is, of course, why these individuals come into the clinic uh, seeking help, but in this case, every bedtime is well past midnight, and uh, wake times, uh, out of bed times, are approaching noon. So this is a very severe shift in the phase of the uh, major uh, rest uh, interval. Now, we know now from uh, sequencing the genome of this individual that they have a mutation in a gene called cryptochrome, which is a part of the circadian clock in humans. And in fact, in humans, uh, cryptochrome takes the place of timeless. It's the partner for PER that allows this partnership to move into the, uh, into the nucleus and interact with the genes uh, to shut them off uh, once a day. In the, in the case of this variant form of cryptochrome found in this subject, uh, there's a change in the structure of cryptochrome. It's actually missing a part uh, of its, of its, uh, of its uh, structure. And that has changed the activity of that per cryptochrome partnership so that it's now a super repressor. That is, it's a super inhibitor. When it comes back into the nucleus and shuts genes down, it does so much more aggressively than does the normal counterpart, with the result that the system stays off longer each day and the rhythm stretches out. It becomes a, a, a slower running clock. The most amazing uh, part of this study was how prevalent we found this mutation to be. So for example, it's found in one in 75 individuals of European descent, one in 75 and one copy is all you need to have this, uh, uh, this sleep disorder. Overall, if we look around the world at many different populations, we see that on, uh, that on the average, about one in 100 individuals uh, carries this. But of course, it has a geographic distribution that probably uh, represents the evolution of this gene, its origin somewhere in Europe or the Middle East, and it spread east and west uh, from there. Now, with something that's prevalent, we realized that we should be able to find other individuals uh, with this mutation and, and uh, ask about their, uh, about their uh, patterns of sleep. And in fact, we uh, set up a collaboration with a group in Turkey who had uh, 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 many different uh, Middle Eastern families whose genotypes uh, were known. And they identified uh, a number of families carrying all these uh, with darkened boxes and circles represent uh, males and females that are carriers, carry that uh, variant form uh, of cryptochrome. And we looked at uh, seven or eight families and found uh, about 50 of each type. So these are, uh, we have unaffected, uh, or, or that is non-carrier uh, members of the family, and we have carrier members of the family, and we can compare within a family uh, their uh, sleep patterns. Now these are modified clock faces, 24-hour uh, clock faces, and what we're doing here is we're looking at the non-carriers, the individuals that carry only normal forms of the gene. They all ha are halfway through their evening sleep at about four in the morning. Now compare that to these, which are the carriers from the same families, and they're midway through sleep. Most of them are midway through sleep around six or 6.30 in the morning, two, two and a half hours later. But we also have another class of sleep patterns that showed up. And these are uh, uh, insomniacs of sort. They're, they're nappers. They, take, they identify their first nap uh, in the evening as their major sleep episode. But they'll take that nap. They'll wake up. They'll take another nap, and so forth. So uh, it's very clear from this kind of a study that having this uh, mutation does confer this kind of sleep behavior. Now, if we know this is an effect on sleep and we know that this is being inherited in families, then we have to assume that that altered clock is running in every part, every tissue 
that these individuals have. So the question becomes, are these going to be like uh, the experimental models in model, like model organisms? Are we going to find altered clocks in other tissues? And yes, if we look, for example, at the skin from DSPD, these DSPD subjects, they have slow running clocks. They run slow, just like the uh, behavior, uh, uh, the overt sleep-wake behavior. So we have to assume that every tissue has uh, an altered uh, clock, a, a clock that's running at, the, at, a, uh, at a new pace. So our interests at this point are very much pointed toward understanding what other features of biology in these individuals are affected by this altered clock. And uh, in particular, we're, we're especially interested in metabolic and psychiatric disorders since these are so often accompanied by problems with sleep. Uh, but it hasn't in the past been really possible to make a direct causal relationship uh, between these two. But if we have, in, in a case like this, a genetic case in which we have large numbers of subjects that share the same gene and share the same sleep disorder, uh, we should be able to really test uh, whether the impact of a particular sleep mutation extends to another, uh, another medical problem. And certainly, if the mutation can be studied in multiple unrelated families, we can rule out uh, effects such as environment. And we can know that we have uh, a change that is related to a, a malrunning circadian clock. So while we're very much focused now on human biology and, and trying to follow this in the future in humans, I want to nevertheless uh, thank one of my oldest colleagues, uh, because all of this is, has been utterly dependent on uh, Drosophila. This little organism has helped over and over again. It's, it's been contributing to uh, science for over 100 years now. Uh, and uh, it, keeps, it keeps opening doors, and I suspect will keep opening doors for us uh, well into the future. But it, uh, the, the, these little flies are our oldest colleagues, so I want to thank them. And I want to thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike. We have time for a few questions. Hi, thank you for that. Uh, just a quick question. Anecdotally, amongst a control group of my friends, it seems that as you get older, sleep becomes more difficult. And I'm wondering if you could comment on the effect of aging on what you have been studying. Yes, yes. Well, uh, your, your anecdotal experiment agrees with, with uh, what's seen in the laboratory. Uh, it's more difficult to do that uh, rigorously with humans, but certainly even in, even in Drosophila, uh, uh, we see this happen. Old, aged Drosophila have weaker circadian rhythms, poorer sleep, uh, uh, poor sleep distribution. And uh, what isn't clear yet is whether that's a failure of synchrony among uh, clocks uh, in different locations or whether it's a breakdown in, in, the, uh, in individual oscillators. And so uh, I think we'll, we'll understand that better in the next few years, but I don't know which of those two uh, components is the responsible component yet. Thank you so much for a great talk, Mike. I wonder if you could um, just elaborate a bit why um, healing occurs better during the daytime. And once we understand that, are there uh, implications for enhanced healing under different conditions? Yes. So uh, right now, it's believed that this uh, reflects the, the, uh, the cells that are involved in regeneration. There are stem cells that, that uh, de-differentiate de and re-differentiate, re as it's called, uh, to, to replace the tissue that's damaged. And uh, those have clocks. And uh, their activity is very much time dependent uh, within uh, those uh, clock mechanisms. So uh, as, I was, as I was mentioning, for, for humans, uh, wounds, burn wounds that occur during the day will heal faster than those at night. In uh, mice, which are nocturnal, their wounds, same, same classes of wounds that occur at night, heal faster than, theirs, than those that uh, occur during the day. So there's something about uh, being in the active part of the cycle that has uh, that uh, uh, coordinated these more rapid responses. I'm a physician with Wild Cornell, and I'm very interested in this. So two quick questions. 
Did Winston Churchill, who was notorious for his naps, have this genetic deficiency or chromosomal mutation? And secondly, what about a country like Iceland, who has that 23-hour day every summer for two months? Do they have a physiological stress on their system because of it? And right. we all know about shift workers, too. Right. Well, so um, I certainly don't know about Winston Churchill. <laughs> Uh, I guess there were, would be ways to address that directly, possibly, but, but uh, I don't know if, if he has descendants, then it might be possible to find out if there is something, uh, particularly as we find more and more genes, more and more genetic variations that are associated with sleep variation. And I, I'll, I'll just point out that I think we may eventually learn that what we used to be calling sleep preference a lot of this may be uh, variation that's much like hair and eye color, where we have these differences uh, in, be, in, uh, in sleep patterns that just reflect the many polymorphisms, the many uh, variations that we find uh, in this set of genes. And we now have large databases, and so we can see that there are lots of differences uh, around the globe. So uh, uh, the second part of your question was about uh, the Iceland and, and uh, so forth. And uh, everyone that lives in Iceland today, 65,000 years ago or so, lived in Africa. So their clocks were formed uh, in a very different equatorial uh, situation where there were nice, even day night cycles. They do have a struggle uh, in those higher latitudes. Uh, with day lengths that, uh, that expand enormously in the summer and contract enormously in the winter. But they also have electric lights and, and, uh, uh, and work schedules and, thing, and, and uh, meal schedules and things of that sort that are largely self-imposable. So I think a, a, lot of, a, a lot of what happens in those uh, situations is that you try to reinforce something much closer to a 24-hour cycle of, of behavior and physiology uh, by things that you set up rather than uh, looking at the natural environment, you recreate an environment uh, that produces something that allows you to be in better sync. Uh, the, the point is, I guess, is that we're rhythmic. We're built to be rhythmic. And the more we can do to make our environment and our internal uh, workings uh, fit with one another, the better, the healthier we are. Oh, what, um, are there any um, positive consequences that you see in terms of this mutation, not just negative consequences? Yeah. I mean, it seems that one in 100, it's a pretty high it's rate. Pretty high. So maybe it's happening for a good reason? Yes. I'm not sure. Yes, yes. So um, uh, I have colleagues uh, in California who have uh, constructed mice that overproduce that that uh, cryptochrome uh, protein. Uh, and uh, that may be very similar to the fact that we've now got a hyper, a, 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 a protein with excessive activity. And in those, uh, in those mice that overproduce that protein, there's a change in glucose uh, 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 metabolism. And so it's, it, it actually produces uh, a form of hypoglycemia in the mice. So if that, if that is reproduced in these individuals, which we don't know yet, then that might be one possible uh, explanation in a particular population in a particular time frame. Uh, we're, we're trying to do as many assessments of their health as possible at this time. And uh, uh, you know the, the, the verdict isn't in on this. This, this is going to take a little time to, to figure out fully. Hi, thank you. So we talk about um, personal hygiene, we talk about mental hygiene, we talk about dental hygiene, we, we obsess about hygienes of all kind. And given the incredible restorative powers of sleep, what does the future of sleep hygiene look like to you? Is it personalized? Is it, how, how, how will we think about sleep as a society you know, in the future in your view? So yeah, I think, I think people are much more concerned uh, about, uh, uh, about these features of their hygiene uh, in ways that they weren't in the past. It used to be that 
uh, uh, a lot of people would brag about how little sleep uh, they get. And uh, I think that's sort of becoming kind of like bragging about how many packs of cigarettes you smoke per day. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll point out something else, which is we, we are, again, it's, it's fruit flies, but we've, we've been isolating mutations that affect the duration of sleep. These are different from circadian uh, mutants, but they affect uh, the balance of sleep and wakefulness. And uh, we have several mutations now in several different genes. And, one, and again, it's Drosophila, it's fruit flies. But one of the things that we see is that there's a very simple correlation between the loss of sleep and a reduction in lifespans. So those that have lost the most sleep due to a mutation have the shortest lifespans. So certainly uh, in the fly, one of the reasons we're trying to, uh, we're, we're using Drosophila to do this is to find out the purpose of sleep. What are the, the functional consequences of reducing sleep? And so that's the first consequence uh, that we've hit. But I think this is something that, that uh, 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 commands a lot of attention. Uh, it's also um, important to think about the fact that you may have uh, some variation in the norm with regard to your sleep pattern. The DSPD subjects, for example, are in a state of perpetual jet lag. It's as if you're on a plane moving an hour, one time zone, every day. And uh, uh, that's not a particularly healthy uh, position to be in. So uh, 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 it, it will, I think it'll be useful for, for us to understand our own personal uh, chronotype, as, it call, as it's called, how close, how close to 24 hours uh, is our behavior. Do we, do we have something that is uh, very hard to throw off because it's uh, genetic? Or are there behaviors that can modify this? One of the things I'll just point out is with the, one of the things we've learned with our D DSPD individuals is that the, the least affected individuals in our population in the Middle East were construction workers who uh, are out in strong sunlight uh, from uh, dawn to dusk. And so the, this does give us some insights in, into ways in which we can help with these kinds of problems. We have time for one last question. So I imagine many people in the room will be checking their emails before they go to sleep. So could you say a few words about the effect of all of these electronic devices on circadian rhythms? Right, right. So uh, you know, one of the things that we all wait for is that little surge of melatonin that gets uh, produced when the lights go down. And uh, that surge of melatonin, of course, uh, makes us drowsy, begins to uh, uh, it's accompanied by the onset of sleep. And of course, when you, when you, <clears throat> that's suppressed, that effect is suppressed by bright light, especially those that are in the bluish range, which most of those screens are in. Uh, I know that you've got uh, uh, programs that are now uh, come with some of the uh, smartphones that make a redder uh, uh, projection of light, and that may help a little bit, but still, it's light and it's gonna, it's gonna have uh, effects. It's most of it, that standard screen is about the worst uh, wavelength uh, you could take at, at that time, time of night. And I'm, my wife and I just shut the phones off. It's not legal to look at your email when you're ready <laughs> for sleep. And it does wonders for your, in many other ways. <laughs> <laughs> well.